And that is the end of our announcements. I'd like to introduce Steve with Digital Six Technologies and his product called Whisker.io, which is a product about Internet of Things. So please welcome Steve. Okay, so, all right, I think I can operate this clear. Guys, this is absolutely amazing. This is my first time at a million cups, so I gotta tell you, I'm really impressed. Uh, like you said, my name is, and I, where, where, where are my slides at? Where I, there we go, there we go. Uh, my name is Steve Montgomery, and I'm the founder and CEO of Digital Six Labs and the inventor of a technology called Whisker.io, which is a wireless Internet of Things technology, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. I've spent about 20, actually closer to 25 years developing these kinds of technologies. For the bulk of that time, uh, I've been involved in startups in one way or another. Good grief, I keep going backwards. Um, so what we do, we develop a long range, we developed a long range uh, battery powered wireless technology for connecting things to the internet. And why is that important? What problem are we trying to solve? Well, the alternative to having things connected to the internet is if you want to know data about them, you have to send somebody out and manually collect that data. We call that the clipboard data collection process. For example, if you, are, if you have an oil or gas well, you have a pumper that may go out and you may monitor three or 400 wells and you may be able to get around the one every two or three days and, and take data on it. And the problem with it is that it's a very manual process so it's inefficient. And because it's inefficient, uh, because it's inefficient and because it's got the human uh, element in it, the data collection tends to be very inaccurate you also tend to get insufficient detail. If you're trying to find a way to reliably uh, and efficiently operate a well, and you're only getting data every three days, the data that you're getting doesn't have enough granularity. The other problem is that the data, the time from the guy collecting the data in the field to it actually making it to the geologists and the engineers that are operating the well takes too long. By the time they get the data, any decisions they would make about it makes it, makes it very hard to uh, control the process at the well and make it efficient. So what we do, I can't if I keep going backwards. I think I've said that before. What we've developed is a wireless Internet of Things technology. And what we do is we actually connect the things directly to the Internet. So you don't need to send a guy out there to monitor them anymore. Instead, we have devices, and I, we're going to go back to kindergarten today because I brought some show and tell pieces that we could talk about. But our devices connect right up and we can monitor oil and gas wells, propane tanks, uh, we've got sensors for agriculture, temperature, and relative humidity. Uh, we've, we can basically monitor and control anything out there. By, by connecting the things to the internet with our technology, it makes the process automatic. And because it's automatic, it's available 24-7. It's also very accurate because it's electronic. It's instantaneous, which means that the data, as soon as it's collected, is available to you for use. And we get very granular data. We could collect data from our sensors every five minutes. The solution is also comprehensive and flexible. And this is important because a lot of the solutions out there that do this kind of thing, they tend to be what we call point solutions. So you have a solution that monitors tank level, and you may have another solution that monitors whether a pump is running, and another one that monitors an engine. And at the end of the day, you have this kludge of, of data sources that you're trying to compile to generate the data that you need to run your business. With Whisker.io, with one gateway and one solution, we can collect all that data for you. So, collecting things to the internet is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to do. If you have access to Wi-Fi and power, it's really easy. If you have, uh, it, so doing it inside your home, for example, with home automation, is a piece of cake. But when you get out in the field or you move into something like a campus or a venue, it gets really hard because in, in a lot of cases, the things that you want to connect don't have power available or they don't have access to a wireless access point that they can get to. That's why you have to use wireless technology. Now, the, uh, in this chart, we show uh, four common wireless technologies that are used in consumer electronics and a lot of industrial electronics. Z-Wave and ZigBee, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't, but these tend to be the predominant ones that people use. And the range is about 335 feet. That makes them suitable for home, office, uh, big rooms, very small buildings. 
They don't tend to work well through metal walls. And because of that, if you wanted to connect sensors up on six floors in a hospital, for example, uh, that, that technology wouldn't work. As a matter of fact, if you think about the last time you went to a hospital to visit a friend and you looked at the, at the ceiling, you saw an antenna farm, right? because they have to put infrastructure all throughout the hospital to repeat the data. Well, with Whisker I.O., our technology is capable of transmitting up to four miles in an environment like that. If we get the antenna elevated something like 150 feet so we can cover a city, we can do 40 miles. And our devices operate for five years from a single set of AA batteries. So that means that you can, basically, we call it peel and stick technology, you can stick this device, you can stick one of our devices on whatever it is that you want to connect and monitor, it'll basically stay there for the life of the device and it'll work pretty much wherever you're at. There's a lot of practical examples for this and I, I, I had to go through, I had to go through and think about what example I really wanted to focus on. So I picked the most benign one because I think this is compelling. We've got a large janitorial services company. I can't give the name, but there's a few of them up there so you can get it. And they're having a problem because they're trying to do uh, cleaning in bathrooms at airports. And creating a schedule for bathrooms at airports is almost impossible because you never have the same number of people in the same bathroom at the same time on any given day. They can't create a fixed schedule that actually works. And so what we were able to do is come in, we partnered with Amazon on this project. We were able to come in and connect hand soap dispensers all throughout and all throughout the airport so that as people are using the bathroom and pushing the button on the hand soap dispensers the bathroom is actually able to tell the janitorial services company hey i've gotten dirty after x number of pushes we probably need a trash cleaning after y number of pushes we probably need a full cleaning and so instead of using a schedule driven process they move to a vid driven process where now the teams are actually getting emails and text messages saying hey this is the next bathroom we need to clean by doing this, they were able to clean the same number of bathrooms with a third of the labor force. This is how compelling this technology is. If we can do this for people that are trying to clean bathrooms, we can do it for people that are operating laundromats, we can do it for oil and gas companies, and we are actually working with some oil and gas companies. So the value proposition that we bring, because of the range and the battery life that we offer, is we improve the lives of people and the way businesses operate by connecting things to the internet so that things themselves can monitor and interact with the world around them. Now, I've got a lot of information I could put out today, but I'm limited to six minutes, so I think I'm done and we can start our Q&A. That's, that's right, thank you. <laughs> Just shout at us. Right. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the physical limitations? Like, where can these well, they work out in water. Okay. Not only in water, but, but physically. Like on the water? In terms of, yeah. Right. So in, 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 in the U.S., per, pretty much every country has unlicensed bands that they can operate in. Most of the time, uh, when people are developing technology like this, they use 2.4 gigahertz, which is what Wi-Fi uses in ZP. And the reason they do that is because that's the same frequency that uh, microwave ovens use. And my, every microwave oven has to use that frequency, so every country that has microwave ovens has to have an unlicensed band for that. Well, that's how that band came to be. From a technology standpoint, it's a terrible band. Our radios operate at the 900 megahertz band. 900 megahertz is really good at penetrating through walls, dirt. Uh, the 2.4 gigahertz gets blocked by water uh, on trees. Ours will push through that pretty good. Matter of fact, the limitations on the Zigbee and Z-Wave usually mostly come from the, uh, the, the, the frequency band that they choose. Ground penetrating radar, for example, the, the stuff that you'll see the cops use sometimes to look down under the ground, that's all 900 megahertz. But our technology isn't just 900 megahertz, it uses a new radio technology called LoRa that has, if, if you can imagine, every radio has a noise floor. And the signal that it receives at has to be above the noise floor by a certain amount or else it won't be able to receive the signal. Our technology actually goes below the noise, is able to receive signals that are below the noise floor. And that's where we get our amazing range from. So we literally, and, and this is very serious, at UConn we're setting up, we're going to be setting up, uh, working with Renesis, setting up uh, an air quality monitoring network for the city of Yukon for a 20 mile radius around the, around the, the city by putting the gateway up on top of the, uh, one of the mills. Well, actually I should say we're 
working on getting that done right now, but that, that we, we, we've tested that. Okay, we have a question here in the front. Um, just to help understand a little bit better, so, and I'm going to use the soap dispenser example. But, so say McDonald's comes to you and they're like, we love your product, we really want to implement it in all our stores. Is it a product that corporate McDonald's puts in all of their stores and then receives data? Or is it a product that each individual McDonald's would put one in and then operate it and use data from it within that single McDonald's? Right, so you're, you're basically asking, and this, this is where, uh, a lot of times when you hear the Internet of Things talk about, you're really talking more about consumer type products, which are, Kind of, you're asking the question, consumer versus enterprise. Is it individual set systems or do they all work together? With our solution, uh, we partnered with Amazon Web Services. They bought a company called Telemetry that does all their Internet of Things stuff, and we partnered with them, so our stuff is, is fully enterprise. Oh, question in the back. So my question is, maybe I missed it during the presentation, but does the device itself have a set of sensors in it, that, or does it interface with some sensors you have um, naturally in equipment and stuff? Uh, it, actually, we have a range. So we, we've approached the market in, in, a, in a very flexible, uh, and I've already used the words flexible comprehensive, but I'm going to use them again because they fit, uh, in, in a very flexible way. OEMs can come to us and say, we want to integrate your technology into our products so we can connect it to the internet. And to do that, uh, we've actually de developed this. This is the heart of our product. It's called the Whisker I.O. engine. It's a little module that can be added onto a circuit board. Uh, all it needs to work is an antenna, a battery, and connection to whatever sensors uh, that you need to add to it. Uh, we also make prepackaged sensor packs these are, include the battery and the antenna, and they, we, we have a bunch of different flavors of this. Uh, they can do temperature, relative humidity, pressure, light. Uh, we have a 3-axis accelerometer for being able to do motion. It can, be pop, uh, it can be populated with GPS. So one of the uses for this is with the, with the accelerometer and the GPS, if you put it on a trailer in a construction yard, for example, and, somebody, and that trailer starts to move, as long as that trailer's within our four mile radius, we can tell you where it's at and what direction it's going. Uh, it also, it, uh, we have these uh, for industrial applications that uh, come in a NEMA 4 uh, waterproof enclosure. Uh, it actually looks like this. And these are actually set up for process type sensors. So they can interface the external sensors for doing tank level monitoring, uh, pressure pump run indication, that kind of stuff. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Right, question in the back. One of my son-in-laws uh, works for a company called Tetra out of Midland, Texas, oil and gas related company. I understand about that much about what he does. Other than he's gone almost all the time and they pay him a boatload of money to do it. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, well, essentially what they do is when shell drills a well and then they, they come in after the well is drilled and set up the equipment for fracking and Blah, 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 and I'm lost after that pretty much. But but a lot of it has to do with reporting and monitoring. So I'm just, and, and some of it's in the middle of nowhere, like Pecos, Texas, and stuff like that. So roundabout way of asking the question, maybe it has to do with, with distance and location, what have you, but how do you apply to something like that and once that equipment set up and they're, they're need to monitor? Right. So oil and gas is pretty much one of our main target markets, and we would have had a really strong launch in that industry in January if it wasn't for the direction the gas prices took and the fact that every major and minor oil and gas company basically halted all new projects in the space, but that's what it's designed, it's one of the primary things it's designed for. I actually have domain experience in that industry, so you take a, a, a from a well operation standpoint, uh, normally you'll have something like maybe an injection well that's putting the, the wastewater back into the ground and it may be surrounded by four or five wells. The way traditionally that this stuff was it has been done is that each of those wells, if it's going to be connected to the internet, needed a really expensive automation package, and each well had to have some kind of connection to the internet, whether it was cellular or satellite or whatever. With this technology, what we can do is we can come in and hang one gateway at, say, the injection station, and we can put our sensors at every one of those five wells, and we can pull the bottom pull pressure and all that stuff. On the drilling uh, side, 
uh, of the equation, we can do the same kinds of things for them because they have mud reports and all kinds of other stuff that they need to monitor. Pretty much, if anybody is collecting data on a clipboard that they're turning into their boss, or even collecting it electronically, we can do it, and we can do it a lot cheaper and a lot longer range. Okay, I have a question via Twitter. What does the monitoring software look like, and is there a web portal? Yeah, so I've got the, a lot of it. <clears throat> We have, a, we have a, a standard solution that we offer that gives you the ability to interact with the devices, uh, look at the historical data, and I've got some screenshots here. If, I can, if I'm going forward, I'm not going forward again. Okay, so this is an example. We've got a mobile application and a desktop application. Uh, Basically what these allow you to do is you can configure your network. And configuring a network is, is actually really simple. If you want to put this sensor on a device, all you have to have is your mobile phone and our, and our application. There's a QR code on the side of every one of these that has a unique ID. You scan the QR code, you give it a name, you tell it what gateway you want it attached to, and that device is online and reporting data. When it reports data, You'll see that there's uh, analog graphs, and then we also have the ability to monitor digital graphs. And uh, this, the technology is two-way, so we can do control as well as, as monitoring. Those top two, the green and the blue buttons, those are um, indicators for outputs. Uh, on, on th this was a demo that we set up for uh, Amazon to be able to turn lights on and off, but that's, that's how it works. And then the mobile software is very very similar. Now, for vertical applications, like right now, we're, we're working on a, a, a solution for doing tank batteries uh, for product that goes into the oil field for doing compressor oil and stuff like that. We have partnered with Amazon and their web services group, and they are actually providing the uh, web the web facing customer centric vertical application portions. So we've got uh, we've got them working on a number of different applications, and that's that's how we approach that. Okay, have another question right here in front. Hi. So if I understand you correctly, the main benefit of this over cellular satellite is that it's more cost effective? Well, if you're going to put cellular, let's take the hand soap dispenser example. If you're going to put cellular in a hand soap dispenser, and, and by the way, that's how Amazon says. Uh, the, the, the companies that are involved in that are Amazon, a company called Sealed Air, which you may or may not know, but these are the guys that invented bubble wrap, so they're a really big, really old company and then the janitorial services company. Sealed Air is actually the ones that are making uh, the hand soap dispensers. And the way they prototyped that and demoed it was they put cell modems in each one of those. The downside, cell modems can get the range, but they can't get the battery life. And so that, that particular opportunity is 400,000 units over an 18 month period. Imagine having to change batteries in 400,000 devices every three months. That's where being able to get the range plus being able to have the batteries last for essentially the life of the thing that it's being attached to is really important because it keeps our solution low friction so people will use it. If it's hard to install, if it's hard to maintain, if it doesn't work right, people won't use it. All right, we have a question back here. Okay, so I do have a question. Um, let's say that I operate a bunch of oil rigs in Montana. But I'm uh, like here is where my office is. Um, is this like a product that I need to like fall within the range, like the 40 mile range, to be able to communicate with it? So do I need to have a clipboard guy go and like go within the 40 mile range of each of these wells to get all of the things, or is it communicating over the internet, like to me? Right, so that's, that's a good question. And you know, in six minutes, it's kind of hard to describe everything about how a solution like this works. The way it works is, it, and, and what I'm showing you today are the commercial versions of our product. We have a, a, a bunch of different iterations, but this is our, our gateway. So in a hospital, for example, if we were gonna be monitoring for leak detection on the sterilization machines, they would have one of these in the hospital. It's got a cellular modem in it, and it connects to all of the sensors. Basically, it acts as a gateway between the sensors and the internet. This is the thing where the 40 mile radius starts, or the center point of the, of the four or 40 mile radius. We've got a commercial version of this. It's in, in a, a, a aluminum enclosure. And basically, the way you approach it is at the well site, you put it up on a pole 15 feet in the air, you give it power, that's all you gotta do. 
then if you're in Oklahoma City, all of the data goes across the internet. So the only the, the range limitation only exists between the gateway and the devices themselves. Did that, did that answer your question? Okay. I'll, I'll switch with you. Hello. First thing to say, I think this is pretty, pretty awesome. Thanks. Um, two questions. One, did you all are you all the creators of this technology, or are you all licensing it from somebody else? And the second question, uh, the internet things is becoming a really big booming industry right now because data analytics. Uh, what's your competition look like also? Well, so actually we are the creators of the, of the technology. Um, the underlying radio technology that gives you the four mile range was developed by a company called Syntech and we buy their chip and integrate it into our product. The, the chip that we buy is only the radio. So the protocol that operates, uh, the way that we do things so that we can get five years of battery life, and the, the way that we designed our units so that all it requires is an antenna and battery to operate. If you take one of those modules and give it a battery power and an antenna, you have a temperature sensor instantly. You can then connect devices onto it. That stuff is all unique. And we actually, we have a provisional going out. Uh, the other thing that's unique about our technology is even though we work over the cloud, Unless we're working with a, a particular vertical that, that Amazon is storing, all of the interaction between our software uh, and the devices goes through the gateway. There's not one password stored in a cloud server. There's no data stored in the cloud server. Everything is stored on the gateways. And the reason we did that is because we're actually kind of paranoid about, about security. If we have 5,000 gateways out there and we have all 5,000 passwords on one server, then if somebody cracks our server, they get 5,000 passwords. If they want to break 5,000 of my systems, they have to do it one at a time, right? And so that's another thing that's, that's unique about our stuff. Um, the, the second question was competition. We do have uh, companies that are building technologies based on LoRa. Uh, microchip is a big uh, microcontroller manufacturer semiconductor. There's a company called Multitech that makes modems. And there's another company called Link Labs that is a startup like us. And they're pretty much approaching the market from this standpoint. They're saying, here's a module, put it in your product. They don't offer a comprehensive end-to-end -end solution. They're basically relying on the OEMs to do that. So we're pretty unique in the space. There's another company that has a business model similar to ours called Monet, but they use a radio technology that only does about 300 feet. And so that's, you know, it, it, we, we either have the guy who does everything and we, we kill him on battery life and range, and to get, you know, a year out of his sensors, you can only get one hour reporting. So. Okay, we have another question here in the back. Have you looked at um, like news stations or an application like this towards putting something like this for the entire city, for the entire city, so they get temperature? Uh, I didn't hear all the things that you can monitor, but where they can put those in different places around the city. Um, no, I have. So give him the microphone back. So I want to ask him a question. If that's okay, I'm sorry. I don't mean to give you orders. Um, so why, why, why would, uh, I, this is one of the reasons I'm here, so when they ask me why I'm here, uh, getting these kind of ideas is one of the reasons. So tell me why, why you think that would be something to do. Um, well, I kind of came in on the tail end of this, so I'm not sure of everything that you do, but I know that you monitor stuff, uh, pressure, right, weather, some of the other things I don't really know. Yeah, we can do temperature, humidity, air quality, all kinds of things. Um, that seems like data that these news stations would want to be able to give to the public. And so if they have different locations all around the city, they already do this and a lot of times they're, they're counting on people to report that data. Um, and they have towers that they can put it on every single one of these cell towers. Um, so, and, it, and if you get them on your side, that's free publicity for you. Yeah, sure, that's a great um, idea. I can give you some contact information for all the ones here in Tulsa. Okay, okay. make sure we connect at the end. So there's a there's a, an actual weather monitoring network called Mesonet that's run out of OU. I think it's called Mesonet, run out of OU. And that's one of the meetings I want to have here pretty soon because they're doing what you're talking about and monitoring the weather, but they're doing it with really expensive short range technology. We would be able, I, I'll give you a, a perfect example. City of Los Angeles called me, they've got They've got these $40,000 air quality monitoring sensors set up around Orange County. But 
they're not, the, the granularity of information isn't good enough. They want to have a lot more sensors. And so the reason they're interested in us is because, you know, for almost nothing, we can hit a, a, a 80 mile diameter uh, in Los Angeles, put air quality sensors everywhere, and we can, we can put hundreds and hundreds of sensors up for what they're paying for one of the EPA certified sensors. So, and they're actually going to be doing a lab certification. Part of the trade we did with those guys is they're going to do our lab certification on our air quality sensor in exchange for getting a few to play with. Okay, and we have another question up front here. Thanks again. Uh, if, is there any way that you can partner with Crime Scene in motion tracking uh, expensive vehicles and yeah. yeah, absolutely. Paul and I are good friends. So we've actually got a new sensor in development that's pretty cool. And what it is is it's a, it's a camera that you can basically stick at the exact same range you can do this. And that camera can grab five seconds of video or it can grab still shots. And the idea here is that you can create business rules in the gateway to say when this, this, and this happens, I want you to get a picture and text it to me. Or if somebody drives through the front gate, I want a, a five-second clip of who's sitting behind that window. And we've actually gotten some pretty good feedback from like the oil and gas that that would be very, very interesting to them. And, and obviously that's a great, uh, a great segue or, or, or way to partner with, with Crime Scene. No, nobody, nobody wants to see Paul succeed with that more than I do, so I'm, I'm definitely interested in doing anything I can to work with him. Okay, and the final question as always, what can One Million Cups and the community do for you? Well, so we're a startup. We have the same needs that every startup has. We've got a really cool technology. Uh, it wasn't a technology that we built looking for a solution. We already had a bunch of solutions in mind. Uh, you know, because it's such a horizontal technology, there's a ton of vertical applications. We've identified a few of them. Some of our partners have identified a few of them. But one of the biggest things that can happen here is just like the conversation we had, there's an opportunity in the laundromat industry for us that we would have never thought of. So ideas for applications, especially if you've got domain knowledge in a particular industry, uh, that's a great, a great help. Helping us get the word out is another one. We're an Oklahoma startup. And everybody who started a technology company in Oklahoma knows the challenges that you face here. We, you know, raising money and, and creating publicity and getting people interested in something that happens in Oklahoma is kind of tough, so getting the word out. And then we also are at a point where our technology, and I didn't get to our status slide, but our technology is essentially done. We're ready to launch. We've got several proof of concept projects out, and we've got a couple of quotes for our first actual production release. So we're ready to actually look at bringing on some investment capital. And so if there's any opportunity to speak to people uh, about that kind of thing, then we'd be very interested. And that's pretty much, that's it. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. So we'd like to thank everybody for coming out. And just as a reminder, every week is here, 9 a.m. Uh, we are also giving away these two shirts. One, like the one I'm wearing, which is way too small. Uh, it's nightclub medium. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we had people uh, uh, tweet uh, witty messages to 1MCTUL, and those two people that will win this, just grab it from the back, is Stacy and Cece. Oh, hey. So, all right. Thank you very much. Anything? All right. We'll see you guys. Tweets. Yeah, read the tweets. Okay. okay. We can read the tweets. They were awesome. In fact, they were the only two people that contributed, so shame on you all. <laughs> So by default they were, but they were actually hilarious all the same. So CC tweeted out for Crime Scene, lost money for college, please call if found. Crime Scene. Yeah. And then the other one is Stacy's. She did also equally witty by saying, Whisker and their sensors can send employees texts when it's time to clean the bathroom based on soap use. Worst text ever. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. Thank you guys for participating. We'll see you guys next week.